I want to uh, give everyone a Merry Christmas here to this congregation. I love you. This has been a, a wonderful joy this year to preach the gospel and work with all of you in proclaiming it to others. I want to thank Bob and all of the elders and everyone here for all the hard work. And I know Bob and I have certainly enjoyed preaching, and we're very glad that we have the opportunity to just really lay bare to a congregation what the scriptures say. So we want to thank you. Now today we kind of have a treat. This is a message I had done a couple of years ago, but I've always thought it was very profound about who Christ is. It's about the coming of the kinsman redeemer. And so this is in our archives, I think, somewhere else. So hopefully I'll give it better than I did last time. You know, it's interesting, the longer I live, the more people I talk to who simply don't enjoy the Christmas season anymore. And if you ask them the reason why, they'll say it's because the holiday seasons for them simply remind them of loss. It may be the loss of a parent. It could be the loss of a spouse. Or God forbid, sometimes it's even a loss of a child. And so for them, the holiday season isn't a time for joy but it's a time that reminds them of this horrendous loss. Now this morning, I don't want to focus on loss. I'm going to focus on hope. A hope that stems from the love of God who in his love sent forth his son to redeem that which is lost. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at why Jesus Christ came. He came to provide redemption to purchase back the people of God who are lost. I think it's very evident and clear from Scripture that every single person is born into this world in a lost condition. We are lost in Satan's kingdom. We are lost in the wages of sin, which is death. And we are lost to eternal wrath. And so, yes, indeed, as we celebrate Christmas this morning, all for us would be lost if it were not for God sending the ultimate kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself said in Luke 19.10 that he came to seek and save that which is lost. And so we're going to be looking at the sending forth of this wonderful Redeemer. And I'm going to begin in a passage that I know so many of you are familiar with, Micah chapter 5. In the fifth chapter of Micah, we see this great promise that this coming Redeemer would be born in Bethlehem. And this was written 721 years prior to the birth of Christ. And so if there's anyone here this morning, or perhaps you're watching this on TV or listening over the internet, and quite frankly, you wonder about the veracity of Scripture, whether Scripture is true, whether the Bible can be believed. One of the reasons you should believe the Bible, that it's the Word of God, that God exists, the Bible is His Word, and Jesus is His Son, is because of predictive prophecies like the one we're going to be looking at today. You see, in the Old Testament, there were 191 historically verifiable prophecies that Jesus fulfilled at his first coming. And by the way, he's going to fulfill more at his second advent. And what's interesting is many of these prophecies were ones that he could not contrive if he was a mere mortal. How can you contrive how you're going to be betrayed? As it said in Zechariah eleven twelve, hundreds of years prior to Christ, it predicted that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Well, here we're going to see hundreds of years in advance this wonderful prediction that this coming Redeemer would be born in Bethlehem. How many in here could control where you were born? No, you had nothing to do with it. And so as Jesus fulfills this, again, it shows there's a God in heaven who knows the future. The Bible is his word, and his son, Jesus Christ, is the great Redeemer. And so we pick it up here in Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 3. And I'm going to read it to you, and I'll stop periodically to make a few comments here. Notice it says, now muster your troops, O daughter of troops. Now let's stop there. We're not going to go any further for a minute. Daughter of troops, what in the world is the prophet of Micah referring to? Well, many of you from your readings in the Old Testament will remember this phrase that you see often that the prophets use, the daughter of Zion, or sometimes it's the daughter of Jerusalem. Well, that generically refers to the Israelites. Well, sure enough, one verse earlier in Micah 4.13, Micah uses that phrase, daughter of Zion. Well, now ominously he changes that phrase to daughter of troops. Why? Because he's foreshadowing the fact that one day they're going to be characterized by people who need troops because of the impending siege at the hands of the Babylonians. 
And so notice he continues. He says, siege, and that would be the Babylonian one, is laid against us. With a rod they strike the judge of Israel on the cheek. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me, one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore, he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has given birth. Then the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. Now, notice, dear ones, in the very beginning of this passage, it's talking about these troops, it's talking about this siege. What's being prophesied here well in advance was the destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of the Babylonians. This happened in 586 B.C. And I want you to think what it would have been like if you were a Jew living in Judah who received this destruction at the hands of the Babylonians. For you, all would be lost. You would have lost relatives. You would have lost friends in battle. You would have lost your nation You were deported to a foreign nation. You lost your capital city. You lost your temple. You lost your religion. Everything was gone. And to make matters worse, notice it says here that they would strike the judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. And sure enough, according to 2 Kings 25, 7, this exactly happened. When Zedekiah, who was the very last king in Judah, the last in the Davidic line when he was removed, was struck on the cheek and his eyes were plucked out. His children were slain right in front of him by the Chaldeans. And so to make matters worse, not only were the people at a loss with their nation, their capital, their religion, their temple, but now even the Davidic king and his future kingdom seem to be in jeopardy. But it's in the light of this milieu, in this backdrop, that God gives a great promise. Notice what I like to refer to as the divine but. All seems to be lost. And then God says, but. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel. Now, notice Bethlehem Ephratah. I have that bolded in black. What's the significance of that? Well, we all know, I think, that Bethlehem is what? It's the seat of David. It's the city of David, isn't it? And so this is where David came from, and this is where the Davidic promises come from. And so the very fact that Bethlehem is being mentioned once again alludes to the fact that God is going to restore what was lost through this coming ruler. Now, I don't have to tell you, I think most of you know that Bethlehem means house, Beth. You have Bethel is house of God. El is short for Elohim. So Bethel is the house of God. Well, Bethlehem is the house of bread. And so here, an effort to, by the way, means fruitfulness. And so out of this sleepy little town, you're going to have a coming ruler. And ironically, this ruler, Jesus, in John 6, 35, says what of himself? He's the bread of life. The bread of life is going to come from the house of bread, and he's going to restore the Davidic kingdom that was lost. Now, notice it talks more about who this ruler is going to be. It says that his coming forth is from ancient days. And I know if you have the New American Standard Bible that I normally use, it'll say instead of ancient days, it'll say days of eternity, which is fine, but I think ancient days is better. Now, here's why. We're wrestling with the Hebrew term olam, and olam sometimes can be rendered eternity, and sometimes it's rendered like this, ancient days. Now, how do we know which is which? Well, I think the focus in this text is certainly on the humanity of the coming Messiah. Now, saying that, don't doubt that the Old Testament teaches that the Messiah was going to be truly God as well. Isaiah 9, 6 that we have in our bulletin, it says, unto us a child is given, a son is born, and his name is what? Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. But here we know the focus is on the humanity. Notice the phrase, God is speaking through the prophet Mike, and he says, From you, that is from Israel, shall come forth for me. Now, if it had been reversed, where it said, From me, God, shall come forth for you, then I think we should render it, 
days of eternity. But you see, the focus is on the lineage. Where is this Messiah going to come from? He's going to come from the lineage from Bethlehem, from David. It's that idea. And he's going to restore what was lost. Think about what God is saying. In the midst of all that was lost from this sleepy little unassuming town, God was going to bring up a ruler who fulfilled the promises from ancient days. What promises? We'll go all the way back to Genesis 49.10. It was prophesied that the Messiah was going to come from Judah. We see in 2 Samuel 7, of all the families of Judah, he's going to come from the lineage of David. And so now here it's being announced once again in the midst of all of that loss. And what is the result of the ministry of this coming Redeemer? Well, there's a lot of other data, but skip down to what's in red. Notice he's going, it says then, the rest of his brothers, that's the ruler's brother, this Redeemer, shall return to the people of Israel. Notice here the phrase, the people of Israel, that stands here to refer to the believing remnant. And so when it says that the rest of his brothers shall return, that's the rest of God's people, the brothers of Christ who belong to the believing remnant. Notice the phrase, shall return. The term in Hebrew is yashuv. It can mean to be restored. I always think of Douglas MacArthur. Remember in 1942, the American forces were kicked off Corregidor. It's a bitter time in American history. All seems to be lost for the people of the Philippines, for the United States military. And what does Douglas MacArthur say? I shall return. That's what God is saying. No matter how bad it looks, no matter how empty your life is, you're carried off to Babylon, you've lost all hope, God is going to return all of the promises through this coming Redeemer, through the lineage of David. Brothers and sisters, God is going to bring a Redeemer to restore all that which is lost. Now, what I want you to do is turn your Bibles, if you will, ahead to the book of Ruth, or I should say back to the book of Ruth. In the book of Ruth, I want to have you turn there because I want to start showing you that there was a foreshadowing of this coming kinsman redeemer that occurred some 500 years earlier around the time of the judges. So what I'm going to show you is that God had already shown an example of what a kinsman redeemer looked like, and that, of course, is the man named Boaz. Boaz is in the lineage of Christ, according to Matthew chapter 1, but he also foreshadows the coming of this great redeemer, Jesus Christ, by being a lesser redeemer a lesser redeemer who also restores all that was lost for a particular family, namely Naomi and Ruth. So turn your Bibles again to the book of Ruth. I'll be bringing you through this, and you're going to see how Boaz was a wonderful foreshadowing of the ultimate kinsman redeemer. Now, when we look at the book of Ruth, let me set the stage. This occurs around the time of the judges, 1250 B.C. And the main characters of the story, when you open up, to the book of Ruth are Naomi and her two daughters-in-law, Orpah, not Oprah. I thought it was Oprah at first when I first read it. It's Orpah. And then you also have Ruth. Now, here's the, the situation. Naomi is a Jew. Her two daughter-in-laws, they are Moabite women. They're Gentiles. Well, they had gone down to Moab to escape a famine, apparently, and they'd lived there for some time. Well, at some time in their lives, while they're living in Moab, Naomi and both the daughters lose their husbands. So all three husbands die. We don't, we're not told how. But what would that do? Well, it would leave all of the women destitute. If you lived in those days, you didn't just go get a part-time job at the Gap to make up for a lost income. This was hev- heavy physical manual labor. And so Naomi, realizing the predicament they are, they're in, she gives permission to her daughters-in-law to return back to Moab to start their lives over. And Orpah takes her up on that, but not so with Ruth. Ruth demonstrates great faith, not only covenant loyalty to her mother-in-law, Naomi, but great faith in the God of Israel that he would provide for her. And we see that then in the beginning, Ruth 1.16. Now again, Naomi has just said, you can go, my daughter, go back, start your life over. But Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to turn back from following you. From where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. There is a de- great declaration of faith. This Moabite woman is going to have the same God that Naomi has, the God of Israel. Now, they're going to both go to Bethlehem. Why? Because Naomi has family there from her husband. And she's going to go in search of what's called a goel, a kinsman redeemer. But first, she has to announce and has announced her sad loss. Ruth one nineteen through 20, it says, So they, that would be both Ruth and Naomi, they both went until they came to Bethlehem. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Notice the reference here to Bethlehem. Bethlehem is the hometown roots of Naomi's husband. She's going back to find support from the God of Israel through the provision of a redeemer. In Hebrew, the term is go out. Now, notice here, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara. That means bitterness. In fact, it should remind us of Numbers 33. Recall, that's where the Israelites come to the waters of bitterness. And what does God do for them? He makes them sweet so they can drink. In a real sense, that's what Naomi is going to have to have. You see, the waters of her life have been made bitter, but she's going back to find a redeemer. A redeemer from Bethlehem who can make her bitter waters of her life sweet and to restore that which is lost. And so on a much smaller scale, you're going to see Boaz does what Jesus Christ does on a grand scale. Boaz is the Lord's provision, but on a much grander scale, the Lord Jesus Christ restores what was lost. Now, let's look at this provision then that Yahweh has given, Ruth 2.1. It says, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech, that was her husband, whose name was Boaz. Now, notice the term that I've highlighted, kinsman. That's the term in Hebrew, goel. It means kinsman redeemer. And basically, and I'll get into more data on what a kinsman redeemer had to do, but they had to restore both property and the family name. That was their function, and it was commanded by God in passages like Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy chapter 25. Okay, now we'll come to that later, but realize he's a goel, he's a redeemer, and who is he? Well, his name is Boaz. Now, to make a long story short, Ruth finds out, and remember, remember she's the younger Gentile daughter-in-law, and she finds out that this Boaz is a redeemer. And so what she does is she goes to his field and she starts to be attracted to this fellow. He's a man of substance and she sees in him great character. Now she goes to his field and she starts gleaning. Now what in the world is gleaning? Well, according to Leviticus 19.10, God had commanded that the Israelites could never, if they had a field, harvest the whole thing. If you had a field full of crops... According to Leviticus 19.10, you could not harvest the whole thing. You had to leave the corners and the edges unharvested so that the sojourner and the poor could glean, meaning take crops by hand, and sustain themselves. So this is provision from God. So Ruth is gleaning, taking crops by hand in Boaz's field, and he takes notice of her. And that's where we pick it up here in Ruth 2, 8, and 12, it says, Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen carefully, my daughter. Do not go to glean in another field. Furthermore, do not go on from this one, but stay here with my maids. Now, let's just stop there. What you're going to find out is that Boaz thinks that Ruth is the cat's me. Wow. And the reason why is because she's a woman of character. She's a woman who is covenantly faithful to Naomi. She's a woman who doesn't go after younger men, which would be normal in a situation like this. She's faithful to Boaz, this goel that God has provided. But most of all, notice this indication that she's a woman who has faith in Yahweh. It goes on to say, may Yahweh, Boaz says, reward your work. And your wages be full from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come come to seek refuge. Now, that phrase that I've highlighted in red... 
under whose wings you have come to seek refuge, that's a marital phrase in the ancient Near East. You see, what a husband would do in marriage is he would spread his wing over his wife. And so what Boaz is saying is, Ruth, you have made the Lord of Israel your husband, knowing that he would provide for you. So this is a statement of great faith. But what's very interesting is hold on to that phrase because the very same phrase that you see highlighted red here is going to be used on the next slide in Ruth 3 for when Ruth proposes marriage to Boaz. Wow, what a scandal. Isn't this great? It's like a soap opera, but it's from the Bible, so it's good. Okay, so this is going to get really good. Now, turn your Bibles ahead here to Ruth 2.20. I got to set the stage for you. What we have is Naomi is going to be playing matchmaker, and she's good at it. What you're going to see is Ruth has been out gleaning in Boaz's field, and she comes back with all this food, and Naomi says, where in the world have you been? I'm paraphrasing. And Ruth says, well, I've been in Boaz's field. And now listen, Ruth 2.20, everyone look at Ruth 2.20. Naomi's response, it says, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, may he, that's Boaz, be blessed of Yahweh, who has not withdrawn his kindness to the living and to the dead. Again, Naomi said to her, the man is our relative. He is one of our closest relatives. So now notice Naomi understands that Boaz is the answer from God. It is his provision. In fact, she says about Yahweh that he has not withdrawn. Notice it says his kindness to the living and to the dead. The term kindness there is that term chaset. It's the idea of God's covenant love that he bestows upon his elect. And here, it's reminding us that God is going to take care of his people. And so the means by which God is demonstrating his covenant love is through this kinsman redeemer. In fact, notice at the end of Ruth 2.20, it says Boaz is one of our closest relatives. The term closest relative is Goel. He's a kinsman redeemer. That's how God is going to restore all things to us, Ruth. He's going to use Boaz, the Redeemer. And so everything is going to go swimmingly. And so what Naomi does is she says, here's what we're going to do. She comes up with a plan. In Ruth 3.3, she says, you're going to get on the market again, Ruth. I think I said that right. Naomi's saying that to Ruth, right? So Ruth has to do three things. She has to take a bath. She has to get perfume on and a new dress. And the idea is she is on the market. No longer is she in mourning. And then Naomi comes up with a real doozy. She says, Boaz is going to be very tired. He's working in his field. He'll have a heavy meal. What you're going to do is you're going to lay next to him by his feet so that he takes further notice of you. And so Ruth does that. Ruth does everything that Naomi says. And when Boaz has finished a heavy meal after working hard during harvest time on the ground of his threshing floor, she lays at Boaz's feet in the dark. And so that's where we pick it up here. In Ruth 3, 9 through 11, this is Boaz waking up with a stranger at his feet. He said, who are you? Which means originally in the Hebrew, who are you? <laughs> Somebody at his, at his feet right in the, in the middle of the night. And she answered, I am Ruth, your maid. So spread your covering over your maid, for you're a close relative. Now let's stop there. Notice, first of all, Ruth says, I'm your maid. She's admitting, I'm a servant of yours. I'm humble. I'm a Gentile. You're a Jew. You're a national. I'm a foreigner. You're a man. I'm a woman. I'm your servant. But then all of a sudden, realizing that this is the provision that God has made, she reminds Boaz of who he is. She says, so spread your covering over your maid. This is shocking. This is a woman, Gentile, proposing marriage to Boaz, an Israelite in his native land. The term covering there is literally the wings. It's the same phrase that was used back in Ruth 2.12 when Boaz said that she had fled under the wings of Yahweh. You see, Yahweh was like a husband, but now she says, I want a husband in the flesh. You marry me, Boaz. Spread your wings over me. And then she says the coup de grace. She reminds him of who he is, for you are a goel. You're a kinsman redeemer. That's who you are, Boaz. Now, what's Boaz's response to this? He's absolutely elated. It says, then he said, 
May you be blessed of Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown your last kindness to be better than the first by not going after young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you whatever you ask, for all my people in the city know that you are a woman of excellence. Notice Boaz says, you're a, your last kindness is better than the first. The term kindness there, again, is chesed. And what he's simply pointing out is that her loyalty is even seen to be greater now because she doesn't go after younger men, although she could. She remains faithful to Naomi. She's faithful to the God of Israel, so much so that even the whole town notices this, and they all know that, yes, she's a woman of excellence. He is absolutely smitten with her. Now, here's the fly in the ointment. They're going to get married. Everything is said. He's going to be a goel and function his duty. But in the narrative, here's the fly in the ointment. There's one man who's closer as a relative. He's a closer goel. So what happens is Boaz is a man of God's word. He says, I'll resolve this issue, Ruth. I'm going to take the matter up at the city gate. And if he declines to be your goel, I'll be the one. And sure enough, that morning, I think it's the next morning, Boaz goes to the city gate where oftentimes business was done. And he approaches the next in kin, that one that was closer to Naomi, this other goel, and he says, will you redeem them? And the man said, no, that will jeopardize my inheritance. And so the wonderful news is they get married. Boaz functions as a husband and as God's redeemer. He marries Ruth, Ruth 4, 13 through 17. It says, so Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and Yahweh enabled her to conceive. And she gave birth to a son. Now let's stop there. How many times is it wonderful news in the scriptures when it says unto us, a son is born? It's wonderful. Whether it be Isaac, or whether it be Christ, or here, we have Obed. A son is born. It says, then the women, this is the women of Bethlehem. They said to Naomi, blessed is Yahweh who has not left you without a redeemer today. And may his name become famous in Israel. Then Naomi took the child and laid him up in her lap and became his nurse. Think about that. All seemed to be lost for Naomi. But because of God's redeemer, He's restoring all that which is lost. The Namer women gave him a name saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Brothers and sisters, let's ask the question, where did this Redeemer come from? Or maybe a better way of asking is, who provided him? Yahweh did. The women of Bethlehem say, Blessed be Yahweh. He has provided a Redeemer, a Goel. And so the redemption comes ultimately from God who sends a redeemer to restore all that which is lost and to make matters even better. Notice it says he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. That means Boaz and Ruth are the grandparents of King David, the great-grandparents from whom the ultimate redeemer will come, the Lord Jesus Christ. The ultimate redeemer will come from the lineage of Boaz, this preliminary redeemer. And he's going to restore not just a family name, but salvation for the people of God. And so I want you to see the connection between the lesser and the greater redeemer. The lesser being Boaz, foreshadowing the coming of the greater, Jesus Christ. Boaz, the great-grandfather of David, think about it. He redeems a Jew named Naomi and a Gentile named Ruth. And then sure enough, 1,200 some years later, the ultimate redeemer comes, the Lord Jesus Christ, a descendant of David and therefore from Boaz. And he also redeems Jews and Gentiles, all who will come to him by faith. Now, I want to talk about who a Goel was. And I want to talk about who could be a Goel. So if you're taking notes, now is the time to really get at it because I want to lay out the four criteria that you had to meet in order to be a redeemer in Israel. All of these things are commanded in the Pentateuch. The first thing that you had to be to meet the criteria of being a goel, a redeemer, is that you had to be related by blood, according to Deuteronomy 25. Now, certainly Boaz was. We see that in the narrative. But how does Jesus Christ fulfill this criteria 
of being a goel. Well, think about John 1.14, that the word, the eternal word, became flesh and he tabernacled among us. That is, the eternal God became a man, and he becomes a man to be our relative, because he has to be the new Adam. Our first Adam gets, in us, gets us all in a ton of trouble. But our new relative, our new representative, functions like a goel because he's related to us. He's truly man, truly related to us to represent us before God. And so in that way, yes, Jesus on a much greater scale fulfills that criteria of being a goel. And so that's what we're celebrating in the incarnation at Christmas. God, in a sense, becomes related to us by becoming a little boy in a manger, becoming a man. Now, the second criteria is that you had to be able to pay the redemption fee. In other words, you had to be wealthy enough. Now, we know according to Ruth 2.1, Boaz was certainly wealthy enough to pay the redemption fee. But how does Jesus Christ fulfill this criteria? Well, it says in 1 Peter 1.18-19 through 19, that when he paid the redemption fee, it wasn't through the precious stones of silver and gold, but through the shedding of the precious blood as of an unblemished lamb. Jesus was able to fulfill that because by the shedding of his blood, he had the riches to pay our redemption fee. So again, on a great scale, grand scale, Jesus fulfills that criteria to be the goel. Now the third one is you had to be willing to redeem. It wasn't enough that you were related, that you had the money to redeem, but you also had to be willing to redeem. Remember that other closer goel refused? Well, Boaz didn't. He was willing to redeem. What about the Lord Jesus Christ? Is he willing to redeem? John 10, 18, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my what? My own initiative. You see, Jesus Christ is a willing goel. He's a willing redeemer who's willing to lay his life down for you and me. He fulfills this criteria of the goel. He's a great redeemer, all from the lineage of Boaz. Now, the final thing, The fourth criteria that you had to meet to be a goel is that you had to be free of debt yourself. If you were in debt, you couldn't redeem someone else. Boaz obviously was without debt. He was a wealthy man. But what about the Lord Jesus Christ? Ultimately, is he not the one without debt? 2 Corinthians 5.21 says that God the Father made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, there was no debt that he had to pay to become sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Because Jesus was the one ultimately without a debt to be paid, he could be a goel and pay ours. Jesus Christ fulfills all of that. And that's why we see in the Old Testament this idea that there is a redeemer in Israel. Isaiah 44, 6, it says, Thus Yahweh, the king of Israel, and his redeemer... The Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there's no God besides me. We see that the Redeemer ultimately is always the God of Israel. Notice in this text here, it says that not only is Yahweh the king of Israel, but he's also what? He's Israel's Redeemer. Both the king that demands the payment, also the Redeemer who pays the payment. All in one person, the God of Israel. This shows that Jesus is Yahweh. Notice it says, I am the first and I am the last. Four times in the book of Revelation, that phrase is used of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the great Goel. He is the Redeemer. Now, let's go back to the Old Testament. We have to find out what was to be redeemed according to the law of Moses. Because then you're going to see that, yes, Jesus does all of these things. He redeems us. Now, to be fair, as I show you these different things that were commanded that had to be redeemed in the Old Testament— Only two of them required a goel. The first one applied to every Israelite, and that is the redemption of the firstborn. So God commanded of three things that had to be redeemed, the firstborn was one of them. Why? Well, he explains various places. But notice in Exodus 34, 20, he says, You shall redeem all the firstborn of your sons. So the firstborn, remember, God considers Israel to be his firstborn. What's the rub in the book of Exodus? Well, Egypt wants to wipe them out. So God does a reversal. Now remember, the firstborn is the one who has the inheritance rights. I'm going to be talking about this next week in another message. 
So the one who has the rights to the inheritance of Yahweh is going to be wiped out by the Egyptians. So God does a reversal, and he says, you want to do that? I'll wipe you out. I'll take your firstborn. He wipes out the firstborn of Egypt and brings his firstborn to himself. Well, in the ancient Near East, the deity required the firstborn to die to belong to them. They did that with human beings. They murdered their firstborn children. But the God of Israel is different. He's the God who created human beings in his image. But yet everything belongs to him, all of the best. And so what he does is he creates a substitute for the firstborn. In Numbers 18, he says, if you have a firstborn child, you have to pay five shekels to redeem your firstborn. Now, what happens then is Jesus Christ is the one who redeems us. In a real sense, God makes us his firstborn, as it says in Hebrews 12, 23, the firstborn enrolled in heaven, because Jesus Christ pays not five shekels, but his own blood. And so he purchases us so that we're also the firstborn who have the inheritance rights of Yahweh. And again, I'll get into greater detail about that next week. And so certainly Jesus fulfills that. And again, this is something that you didn't have to be a goel to do, but it was required. Now, the next thing that had to be redeemed did require a goel. It was an Israelite's name. According to Deuteronomy 25, an Israelite's name could not perish. Why? I think ultimately why is because the God of Israel is the covenant God who gives life. And it's incongruous to have a man's name in Israel blotted out if he's under the God of Yahweh, the God who gives life. And so what God commands is that there be a next of kin. If a man died and he had a wife, the next of kin, usually a brother, would have to perform something called the Leverite marriage. Leverite means husband's brother. And so that man would have to take the deceased brother's wife to continue the name so his name would not be blotted out. And in a real sense, that's what Boaz is doing as a goel in the book of Ruth. Notice Deuteronomy 25, 6. It says, then the first son she bears, so this is the new husband who's related like a goel, then the first son she bears will continue the name of the dead brother, thus preventing his name from being blotted out of Israel. Now, how in the world does Jesus fulfill this, giving and keeping the new name? Well, turn your Bibles to Isaiah 62. I want you to see how Jesus fulfills this, fulfills this as a kinsman redeemer. Again, turn your Bibles to Isaiah 62, 2. In Isaiah 62, God's people have been promised great hardship, but in Isaiah 62, we see that there's going to be a restoration of the glory of Zion. And part of that is that they're they're going to be given a new name. Their name will be restored once again. Isaiah 62, 2, it says, Nations will see your vindication. That's the vindication of Zion. And all kings, your splendor. You will be called by a new name that Yahweh himself will give you. So stop there. When you unpack eschatology, the end times, it looks as if all the people of God are going to be wiped out. That there's no trace of anyone who calls God by name left on the earth. But he's going to do a reversal, and he's going to give the people of God a new name that will never be blotted out. In fact, when you get to Revelation chapter 3, not is this only going to apply to Zion, but there's going to be a new name given to every single believer in Jesus Christ. He will redeem our name. And we'll have a name that represents our God. And finally, we'll give him glory as he deserves. And so it's in that way that Jesus Christ redeems us, and he'll give us a new name as the great go well. Now, the final thing that had to be redeemed was land. According to Leviticus 25, 23, Yahweh owned the land. So you couldn't lose it in perpetuity. I think that's a term. Oh, it just came to me. I don't use that term often. You couldn't, if you couldn't sell the land for an indefinite period of time, let me restate that. Why? Because it's not yours anyway. It's Yahweh's. And so he demanded that it had to be redeemed. And that's what we see here in Leviticus 25, 25. If a fellow countryman of yours becomes so poor he has to sell part of his property, then his nearest kinsman, there's the goel, is to come and buy back what his relative has sold. 
how in the world does Jesus fulfill this? Think about in Revelation chapter 5. All of the angels are extolling the virtues of Jesus, this great Redeemer. And they say about him in Revelation 5.10, You have made them, that's believers, to be a kingdom of priests, and they shall reign where? Upon the earth. Yes, there's going to be a land that's going to be redeemed for us. See, it's all lost in the 70th week of Daniel. It seems that the entire world lined up with Antichrist has taken it. But Jesus Christ, when he returns, restores even the land for us. Yes, Jesus Christ is the great redeemer. And he does all of these things. He's going to restore us to firstborn status. He's going to restore and give us a new name. He's going to restore us so that we have a kingdom to dwell in. Because he's the great Goel. Now, we see, sure enough, Jesus announced that he's going to come and provide redemption in the beginning of Luke chapter 1. Here's Zacharias, remember the father of John the Baptist? He's prophesying here. Right after he had the birth of his son, he's prophesying about the coming of Christ. Zechariah's mouth has been loosed. He says, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of David, his servant. Notice, Zacharias is saying redemption's coming. The very promise that was given to us in Micah chapter 5 that we began this whole message with was God was going to send a redeemer to restore that which is lost. And now Zacharias is saying he's at hand. God is going to send him. In fact, notice he is going to raise up a horn of salvation. In the ancient Near East, the horn was a symbol of strength, and it became synonymous with a king. The king had ultimate strength. And so here you could literally say he raised up for us a king of salvation from where? The house of David. Isn't that where he was to come from in Micah 5, from sleepy little Bethlehem, the city of David? So all of the promises that we see in Micah 5 are now being fulfilled right here. And this Jesus Christ is going to purchase God's people back, not with five shekels of silver, but with his own blood. So says Peter to the people of God. He says in 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19, And you were redeemed, released, literally, with perishable things. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of unblemished lamb and spotless the blood of Christ. Dear ones, let me ask the question, when Jesus pays the ransom fee when he dies on the cross, to whom does he pay the fee? You see, for years in church history, there was what's called the ransom theory of the atonement. And we had Christians who were getting it wrong. They say, oh, the payment's paid to Satan. You see that same thing today in the circles that are part of the Word of Faith movement. They'll say, yes, there has to be a payment paid. Jesus pays it to Satan. No, the payment isn't paid to Satan. The payment is paid to God. Jesus is the one who demands justice, but he as God is also the one who humbles himself and becomes a man, a goel, and pays the debt. That's what Jesus Christ does for us, the great goel. Now, why do we need redemption? Well, again, we're all sinners, incompatible with a holy and righteous God. So says the writer in Psalm 5, 4 through 5. He says, Certainly you are not a God who approves of evil. Evil people cannot dwell with you. Arrogant people cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who behave wickedly. Here we see in Psalm 5, 4 through 5 that the issue is we as sinners are incompatible to be in the presence of a holy God. But we also see in Isaiah 59, that God is angry with our sin and it creates separation. He says, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Remember a few weeks ago, we were talking about in the ancient Near East, if you had the monarch's face, if he lifted up your face, it meant that you had his favor. Well, notice in this text, it says that the sins have made Yahweh hide his face from us. So we don't have favor with the monarch, the ultimate king because of our sins. We don't have favor with him. In fact, notice it's created a separation. That's what death is. The wages of sin is death. Death in the Bible is not annihilation. It's not that you cease to exist. Death in the Bible is separation. The first death is separation of body and soul. 
When a person dies, if they're an unbeliever, their body goes into the ground, their soul goes into Hades in torment, waiting ultimate torment in the lake of fire. Now, for a believer, it's wonderful news. Because when they die, their body goes into the ground, but their soul goes to be with the Lord. That's the first death. The second death is even worse because that separation, again, from God, not just for a little while, but eternally in the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, 15. Death is separation. Separation ultimately from God and the blessings of his face. Now, that's why Jesus Christ came. He came to purchase us who were separated from God. And so Jesus paid the price. We're going to get into great detail when we come to this in our studies in Romans. Romans 3, 23 through 25, he says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. Notice the term redemption there. Apolutrosis is the term. And it means to be released from something through a payment paid. So the idea is Jesus Christ pays the payment and then you and I are released. Released from what? We're released from sin, released from death, released from the bondage of Satan and going to hell. That's what we're released from. All because of Jesus Christ, the great Redeemer. Now, how does he do that? Well, he dies. And on the cross, he becomes a propitiation. The term here, propitiation, links us back to Leviticus 16 in the mercy seat. To make it quite clear, propitiation has to do with Jesus Christ being a substitute on the cross so that as he dies, he takes upon himself the full measure of God's wrath that you and I deserve to be punished with so that God is appeased. So propitiation is God-centered. God demands a just payment paid. Jesus is the one who pays it and satisfies God for those who believe. That's what propitiation is. We see the same idea in Galatians 3.13. By the way, I had a typo in your notes. It's not Galatians 3.23. It should be 3.13. Galatians 3.13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Notice this term redeemed is a verb ex agorazzo. Agorazzo, some of you can hear the term agora. The idea is that we've been purchased in the marketplace. You and I were in Satan's marketplace in bondage to sin, death, and hell. Jesus, the great Redeemer, purchased us from that marketplace. He chose us, decided to pay the redemption fee. How? Well, it says by becoming a curse for us. Notice the term for there, the preposition who pair is often used with the idea of substitution. The idea is that he would be a substitute and do what we couldn't do on our behalf. He became a curse on our behalf. Jesus Christ paid the redemption fee. That's what he did on the cross for you and I. Now, what's the proof of this? Well, the proof is seen in the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. And in his resurrection, God vindicates and proves that, yes, This Jesus is his great Goel, the Savior. What must we do? Well, this Jesus not only was raised from the dead, he ascended into the heavens, he's seated at the right hand of God, and he commands every single person to repent and to believe the gospel. Repentance has to do with a change of mind and then a change of direction. The whole world is going away from God in their own idolatry. What he wants to do, us to do, is to turn and come to God in his terms through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone. If there's anyone that's a Muslim, you have a false religion, you need to turn. If there's anyone who's a Mormon or a Jehovah Witness, you have a different Christ, you need to turn to the true one. If someone's an atheist and they're listening, you're your own God. It's not that you're without religion, you're very religious, and you serve yourself, turn from that. Turn from all of these false religions and serving yourself, turn to God on his terms, which is trusting in Jesus Christ alone, All of that by grace alone. And if you'll do that, you have the promise from Scripture that God's great Goel has purchased you from the wrath to come. And he's given you something that you desperately want, which is eternal life. The result of redemption, my dear brothers and sisters, is wonderful. 
And so I want to speak to you because I know many of you here today as brothers and sisters who believe in Jesus Christ have had great loss over this last year. And so I want to remind you of a man who also lost everything. We're going to end with this. Remember, some 1,900 years prior to the coming of Christ, the very first book that was written was written by, uh, or was written of Job at least. Job was a man who suffered a lot. He lost his family. He lost many of his friends because they wouldn't have anything to do with him anymore. He lost his reputation. He lost his prosperity. All seemed to be lost. And yet listen to how Job demonstrated his trust. He said, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that at last he will take his stand on the earth, even after my skin is destroyed. Yet from my flesh, I shall see God. Yes, there was a day when Job thought all was lost. His family, all of his livelihood. But notice where his trust is. One, it's in the resurrection. He says, even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God. I think it's very possible that that's the first reference to the belief in the resurrection. But nonetheless, his faith is squarely on whom? It's on the Goel. It's on the Goel who lives. And the question for you, as we celebrate Christmas, is this baby boy your Goel? Is he your redeemer? Is he your kinsman redeemer? Because if he's not, then all is still lost. But if he is your Goel this Christmas, then there's nothing that's lost. All is redeemed. God will restore all things to you. It may not happen now, but when the king comes and the kingdom comes, he's going to restore for you all that was lost because he sent forth the ultimate kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope that's a comfort to all of you here who have suffered loss this Christmas season. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that you've sent the great kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be willing to lay down his life, who was able to lay down his life and to make a way for us for salvation, that he would pay the debt that we couldn't, to purchase us from the marketplace of Satan and to deliver us into the kingdom of your beloved Son. We thank you, Lord. We long for the day that we get to sing your praises in eternity when your great Goel comes, when he comes again to bring us this great kingdom that he's promised in the restoration of all things. So, Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, those especially who have had loss, I pray, Lord, that this Christmas season they would trust in your son, the great Goel. That they would know that there's a day that's coming when all would be restored. I also pray for our conversations at Christmas time with unbelieving relatives and friends. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would show the healing that can be found in the God of Israel through the death and resurrection of your son, Lord. I pray that we would have these conversations. You'd give us boldness to proclaim your gospel and that others would find redemption through your great kinsman redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please stand for the benediction. Well, I'm sorry, you know what? We got a wonderful song. I'm sorry I even knew about that.
for that song. Beautiful. Think about in our message, everyone. We saw in Isaiah 59 that sin caused a separation and God hid his face from us. We talked about how when you didn't have the king receive your face, it meant you didn't have his favor. Well, the Goel came to bring us that favor back. So I want to give you the ironic benediction. Listen to how fitting this benediction is when you realize what having the face of God shine upon you means. This is what Aaron was to say to the people of God. He said, Yahweh bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, ultimate peace that comes from the Redeemer. God bless you. I hope you all have a wonderful Christmas time and you're all safe. We see you back here next Sunday. God bless.